Tonight, states of emergency, the deadly winter storm slamming the east, the storm blamed for at least 10 deaths, up to 20 inches of snow in some parts, hundreds of crashes reported on the highways, the passenger plane sliding off the tarmac. Also breaking tonight, the mall shooting unfolding at this hour, dramatic video, customers wounded and running for cover. At the White House, President Trump blasting two damaging headlines, one involving Russia and his private meetings with Vladimir Putin. Where are notes of that conversation? The other report about the FBI concerned the president was working for Russia. The government shut down now in its fourth week. One of the president's most vocal allies in the Senate urging him to reopen the government. This as the shutdown forces more airports to close terminals because of a TSA shortage. Also, the urgent search for a missing mother in Texas, disappearing on her way home from a friend's house. And Netflix crackdown? The new technology capable of tracking down who is freely sharing accounts with friends and family. The password firewalls that are sending millions of viewers into an instant panic. From ABC News, this is ABC World News Tonight. And good evening. Thanks for joining us on this Sunday. I'm Tom Yamas. And we begin tonight with the deadly winter storm stretching from the Midwest all the way to the east. More than a foot of snow in some parts. Virginia's governor declaring a state of emergency. Many highways dangerous even for sanders and snow plows. A truck overturning in Fairfax County, Virginia. And a Delta passenger jet carrying more than 120 people sliding off the tarmac at Cincinnati Airport. And take a look at this snow blanketing the boardwalk in Wildwood, New Jersey, turning that summer destination into a winter wonderland. The system pushing snow and brutal cold into the northeast tonight. Wind chills in the teens by the morning. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is in Washington to lead us off. Tonight, that deadly winter storm reaching the east coast. Millions from Kansas to southern New Jersey digging out from a massive wintry blast. Ice and snow making roads treacherous. At least 10 dead, dozens injured, nearly 200,000 without power across eight states. Virginia's governor declaring a state of emergency there. Icy conditions causing this sand truck to flip over. Motorists abandoning their cars in Maryland. Whiteout conditions blinding drivers and authorities in that state describing the hazardous roads at one point as being impossible to get around on. In the nation's capital. We're approaching 10 inches of snow here in our nation's capital. White House is 200 yards that way and you can barely see it through this heavy snow. Government workers clearing walkways in the National Mall, shoveling during the government shutdown and not getting paid for it. It's not fair. You know, no one enjoys doing it. We do it because that's, that's, that's part of our, our job as it is right now. And in Pittsburgh, crews rescuing two people after their cars slipped off a snowy road. And parts of North Carolina glazed in a half an inch of ice. In the Midwest, the cleaning up now beginning. West of St. Louis, the storm dumping up to 20 inches of snow, wreaking havoc on highways statewide, resulting in at least 800 crashes in Missouri. Air travel also impacted in the region, with at least 800 flights canceled nationwide and over 2,200 delayed. This Delta plane skidding off an icy tarmac in Cincinnati this morning. Fortunately, no one on board injured. The storm causing so many problems in so many states. Rob Marciano joins us live now. Rob, we can see the snow there coming down in D.C. still tonight. Where is the storm headed now? Well, eventually out to sea, but at snowfall rates like this, we're going to get a couple of more three inches. Probably you can see the Washington Mo Monument behind me or, or can't you because of this heavy snow. On the radar, we have this snow swap. The shield does extend through Pittsburgh, but the heaviest through Baltimore, D.C., Arlington, and through Maryland. This will eventually go out to sea, but not till after midnight tonight. So a couple of more inches expected. And then behind that very cold air, wind chills will be in the teens and certainly below freezing. So the snow will freeze overnight. In the west, we have several more storms to come through in central and southern California. Heavy rain tomorrow, heavy mountain snow, winds to 60 miles an hour. Another one after that here in D.C. Temperatures will barely get to the freezing mark tomorrow, Tom, so the snow is not going anywhere anytime too soon. All right, Rob Marciano leading us off tonight. Rob, thank you. Now to breaking developments in the west. Police on the scene of a mall shooting in Utah. Customers wounded and running for cover. The search for the gunman underway. A warning, some of the images you're about to see are graphic. ABC's Ariel Reshep with the details coming in at this hour. Tonight, a hail of gunfire unleashing mayhem at a Utah mall. 
sending shoppers scrambling to take cover. Bystanders tending to these two victims, one tying a tourniquet on this woman's leg. Police swarming the scene, evacuating the building, clearing stores one by one. Do we have anybody over by the Craig Farrell? We have about 30 to 50 people waiting to leave the store. This, the third shooting at a U.S. mall just this weekend. Earlier today in North Carolina, one person gunned down in this shoe store after a dispute. The suspect now in custody. And panic at this packed New Jersey mall Friday night after shots rang out. Two people rushed to the hospital. Tom, three suspects are still at large in Utah. Police investigating that incident as possibly gang related. Tom. Ariel Reshef with what's been a violent weekend across malls in this country. All right, Ariel, thank you. Now to the other major news tonight. President Trump railing against headlines involving the Russia investigation and private talks with Vladimir Putin. Following a New York Times report, the president asked if he ever worked for Russia, calling that question insulting. President Trump also rejecting a Washington Post report about concealing details of personal meetings with Putin. And though the president is denying the accusations, our White House correspondent Tara Palmieri is learning some members of Congress want answers. Tonight, a bombshell report in the Washington Post claiming President Trump went to, quote, extraordinary lengths to conceal details of his conversations with Russian President Vladimir Putin from his own administration. The Post reporting that at that private meeting in Hamburg back in 2017, the president confiscated his own interpreter's notes, shutting out members of the administration. The president denies he did anything wrong. I don't care. I mean, I had a conversation like every president does. I do it with all countries. We had a great conversation. I'm not keeping anything under wraps. I couldn't care less. The paper also quoting an unnamed official who claimed that when the president and Putin met in Helsinki with their interpreters in July 2018, Trump accepted Putin's denial of Russian meddling in the 2016 election, saying, quote, I believe you. I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. The president later walked back those comments, but the White House calling this report, quote, outrageously inaccurate. While critics are saying this breaks protocol, Republicans are standing by him. I know what the president likes to do. He likes to create a personal relationship, build that relationship. I want to find out a little bit more about, about what happened there. I want to learn more than just the allegations in the press. The White House shooting down another shocking report in the New York Times. And the paper claimed the FBI opened a counterintelligence investigation into whether the president was acting on behalf of the Russians when he fired FBI Director James Comey. Last night on Fox News, the president asked point blank whether he worked on behalf of Russia. He fired back at the Times, but did not respond directly. Are you now or have you ever worked for Russia, Mr. President? <laughs> I think it's the most insulting thing I've ever been asked. And if you read the article, you'd see that they found absolutely nothing. All right, Tara Palmieri joins us now from a snowy White House tonight. And Tara, you have some new reporting that Democrats have a renewed interest in hearing directly from the interpreter who was in that private meeting with Putin and the president. That's right, Tom. A senior Democratic aide tells me that lawyers for the House Intel and Foreign Affairs Committee plan to meet tomorrow to discuss taking up an unprecedented action, calling the president's interpreters to testify before Congress. Tom? Tara Palmieri for us tonight. Tara, thank you for that. Also at the White House tonight, President Trump facing growing frustration over the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. The president still threatening to declare a national emergency to fund his border wall. The toll of the shutdown growing even more severe at airports in Miami and Houston. They're closing terminals there because of a TSA shortage. The new ABC News poll shows 53 percent blame the president and the GOP for the shutdown, 29 percent blaming Democrats. And while a majority of Americans do not believe there is a crisis at the border and most reject calls for the wall, according to the poll, 42 percent do support it. Here's ABC Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, effects of the shutdown starting to surface. Terminals having to close at airports like Houston Bush and Miami's International Airport. The TSA says a large number of workers have called out, more than doubling last year's rate. President Trump lashing out at Democrats over the shutdown as he renews his threat to build the wall without Congress. I am ready to sign. And if they don't do it, if they don't come to their senses, you know what I'll do? I'll do a national emergency. We're all set. It's 100 percent. But now a top Republican pressuring the president to end the shutdown before taking drastic measures. I would urge him to open up the government for a short period of time, like three weeks. 
before he pulls the plug, see if we can get a deal. If we can at the end of three weeks, all bets are off. See if he can do it by himself through the emergency powers. Democrats say they'll fight a national emergency declaration. But if this president is going to turn to national emergencies every time he disagrees with Congress, I'm against it. Let's make sure the branches of government are bound by the same constitution. And nearly 800,000 families missing their first paycheck since the shutdown began. We're going to have to take loans. We're going to have to use credit cards. I mean, I really don't want to be in that situation. We're a working family. We earn our paycheck. We pay our bills, take care of our kids. That's all that we want to do. All right, Stephanie Ramos joins us now from Capitol Hill. And Stephanie, tonight, as talks remain deadlocked, you mentioned more terminals shutting down and the situation at airports could start to cause major delays. That's right, Tom. There was a significant spike in call outs just from yesterday to today. I noticed while traveling the last couple of days that TSA pre check lanes were closed at several airports. Now, there hasn't been a report of any major delays today, but that could change. Tom. Stephanie Ramos, live from Capitol Hill for us. Stephanie, thank you. We do move on now to another big story. We're following the new developments in the kidnapping case that made national headlines. Authorities looking for any possible connection between 13 year old Jamie Kloss and the 21 year old suspect accused of targeting her and killing her parents. These new images coming in of the remote house where she was held captive for three months. ABC's Alex Perez is in Wisconsin. Tonight, Jamie Kloss wrapping up her first weekend with family after three terrifying months in captivity. The 13 year old all smiles, posing with loved ones across town, signs of support everywhere you look. Suspect Jake Patterson's motive remains a mystery. Police allege the unemployed 21 year old kicked down the Kloss's front door last October, shot and killed her parents so he could take Jamie. But authorities don't yet know why. Jamie was the target of, of Mr. Patterson. He didn't know the clauses. He had no contact with the clauses that we've been able to uncover at this time. Investigators say Patterson held Jamie captive at this home about 70 miles away in Gordon, Wisconsin. A sign reading Patterson's retreat hanging above the front door. This is the property where authorities say Jamie was held captive for 88 days. The home can't be seen off the road. It's behind that garage there. Neighbors who live in this area say there was always something different about this house. Did you ever see anything weird or suspicious there? No, it's just a, you know, I, it's just not a place I ever felt really comfortable walking by. I never saw anybody. Patterson's childhood friend, Dylan Fisher, telling ABC News he never imagined his quiet, happy friend would be accused of something like this. I'm asking myself a lot of questions, and none of it makes sense. Fisher's mom also remembering Patterson's visits. I never had a, an inkling that he thought that way. Patterson's attorneys in a statement saying in part, this is a very tragic situation. Mr. Patterson's legal team will be relying on the integrity of our judicial system to ensure that everyone's rights are protected and respected. And Alex Perez joins us live now. And Alex, that suspect will have his first court appearance tomorrow. And we may learn more about why he targeted that teenage girl. That's right, Tom. He's doing court tomorrow afternoon. Much of this case remains a big mystery, but when prosecutors file a criminal complaint tomorrow, we may finally learn some details about a possible motive. Tom? Alex Perez on this story from the get-go. Alex, thank you. Now to the police tragedy in Birmingham, Alabama. A sergeant killed, an officer critically wounded during a shooting outside of a nightclub. Officers saluting the procession carrying the body of Sergeant Watasha Carter, a husband and father. Police say they were investigating a rash of car break-ins, catching two suspects in the act. One of them, though, opened fire. Here's ABC's Zachary Kish. Tonight, Birmingham police reeling from a shootout that took an officer's life. Medical aid on a gunshot wound reported to be involving police officers. Thanks for sure. Sergeant Watasha Carter and another officer were investigating a burglary around 2 a.m. when they approached two suspects at a vehicle. The officers approached one suspect. He armed himself and fired upon our officers. Both officers and a suspect were hit in an exchange of bullets. 44-year-old Sergeant Carter died at the hospital. Police still looking into the possibility of a third suspect. We have um, one suspect in custody, and we have one suspect who is receiving medical treatment right now, and the investigation is still ongoing at this time. And Birmingham police saluting their fallen friend and mourning one of their own. 